Lord Balfe. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper and draw my attention to the entries in the register. Uh, <clears throat> my Lords, our exit from the EU will enable us to pursue an independent foreign policy and the political declaration sets out the framework for an ambitious, deep and special future relationship with the EU which will enable us to continue to work closely with our European allies to tackle the common threats we face and to promote the values and interests that we share. And the deal respects the EU's decision-making autonomy and the UK's sovereignty. Can I thank the noble lady for her answer and uh, regret that it's some time since we've seen the Minister. Presumably he is ill and I'm sure we would all wish to send our good wishes to him for a speedy recovery. Um, can I point out that uh, we have had 115 British nationals working the External Action Service and presumably doing some good in spreading Britain's way of doing foreign policy in the world. 33 of them have been seconded from the UK Government and are coming back to Britain but the other 82 are now precluded from taking any post in a European Action Service delegation abroad. Has the Government thought that this could in any way assist us in projecting Britain's presence in the world? <coughs> well, what I would say to my uh, uh, noble friend is that uh, since its launch in December 2010, the EEAS has played an important role in delivering European foreign and security policy, and the UK is strongly committed to ensuring that this continues in the uh, future. With regard to secondments, we do see considerable value in the reciprocal exchange of expertise, including through the secondment of experts, and as reflected in the political declaration, we will be seeking an agreement for the secondment of personnel where appropriate and where in our mutual interest. My <coughs> Lords... My Lords, can I just uh, ask the noble? I thought it was our side for one moment. Um, can I ask the noble lady, the minister? Uh, there's a lot of aspiration in the political declaration, particularly about maintaining influence. But that aspiration also includes joining many of the structures and agencies within the EU. Can the noble lady, the minister, tell us whether any assessment has been made? of the cost of joining these agencies separately. It's not just <coughs> losing influence. We won't even be able to determine how much we're paying. Can the noble lady, the minister, answer? Well, I don't think the noble lord would expect me to give specifics when these specifics clearly will be a matter for further discussion with the EU um, under the political declaration. But what I think he will be aware is that um, within the EU, the UK has actually been pivotal in developing many of the facilities and agencies which I think we all value. Therefore, we do understand them, we're in sympathy with them, and we would have a natural desire in wanting to uh, continue these partnerships, um, where, as I said before, that's in our mutual uh, best interests. Um, you'll also be aware that the rest of the world um, does not actually look at the UK through the prism of being part of the EU. The rest of the world looks at the UK as being a sovereign state in its own right and uh, a global operator on the world stage. But of course, we do um, and have said consistently how we want to develop and strengthen our bilateral relationships with partners in Europe and globally, and that's what we shall be endeavouring to do um, in the months and years ahead. My Lord, the Minister may recall the, role, the major role that Lord Carrington and Geoffrey Howe played in the development of the structures of European foreign policy cooperation. Uh, the political declaration is extremely vague on all of this. Does the British government hope that British foreign secretaries will continue to take part in meetings on shared foreign policy cooperation in the European Union and that British officials will continue to take part in the many working parties that have since been developed or will we be sitting outside the room waiting for the results afterwards? 
Well, I might suggest, the noble lord, that what matters here is, is not so much um, particular processes and structures. What matters is working with like-minded partners in whatever format seem uh, appropriate. Now, as he will be aware already, we uh, work in, uh, for example, the Quad format. We, we work in the G7 format. We issued through Quad and G7 statements from Russia, coordinated expulsions by Western allies in response to Salisbury. We agreed E3 proposals for sanctions in North Korea. And we've seen P3 action in Syria and launched G7 group on hostile interference in democracies. That's just an illustration of how there are various ways of engaging. We can do that uh, bilaterally. The, my lords, the, my lords, the minister, the minister, cross bench, cross bench. The minister is a very wise lady, and she would agree with me that all the other 27 member states are sovereign rights, sovereign countries in their own right, as well as the UK. So why are we so childish and anxious to leave? the most successful EU organisation as, as we know it. And doesn't she agree with me that staying in the European Action Service is one of the 4,000 reasons why should we should remain in the European Union? Well, I think the Noble Law's views are well rehearsed in this respect, and uh, I think the views he's expressed come as no surprise to the Chamber, although I do regret the use of the words like childish. I mean, what we have to acknowledge is that the citizens of this country asked to make a decision made that decision, a decision which the government, in my opinion, absolutely correctly um, is striving to implement uh, and respect. My Lord, at the moment in overseas posts, it is normal for the British overseas representatives to meet with their European counterparts and with the European Union representatives for regular meetings yeah, yeah. to exchange yeah, yeah. information. Is it assumed that there will be some formal relationship for this excellent uh, procedure to continue? Quite right. Yeah. Well, as I indicated to the Noble Lord, Lord Collins, the detail of such arrangements and relationships will rest with the future. But as to the spirit in which the UK would approach these vital discussions, I've tried to explain that we are in sympathy with many of the agencies, facilities, relationships and partnerships within the EU, which have so helped uh, both the EU and the UK. And we would certainly want to approach these discussions constructively and in a positive, in a positive manner. My lords, my lords, my lords, my lords, my lords, very briefly, my lords, given that the EU is very largely responsible for the tragic situation in Ukraine, uh, can, can the government tell your lordships of any specific successes in Brussels foreign policy? With the greatest of ease, I would say to the noble Lord, Lord Collins, answer that. I've never heard such an extraordinary, illogical connection of unrelated events in my life. I wasn't aware... <laughs> I wasn't aware it was the EU that aggressively attacked three Ukrainian vessels and took captive their uh, crew. And I think, again, we have to be very careful about language in this chamber. Yeah. Yeah. Cox. Lord, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. Uh, my Lords, there has been a tragic escalation in intercommunal violence in Nigeria this year. Now, while religious identity certainly is a factor, the drivers of the clashes are complex and they do need to be addressed if the violence is to be curbed. The United Kingdom government has not seen evidence that links Fulani herdsmen to Islamist insurgency in the northeast. And it is important that we avoid conflating the two issues uh, because that may risk exacerbating ethnic tensions. I thank the noble lady minister for her reply. But may I ask, while the causes of violence are indeed complex and multifaceted, does she not agree that the asymmetry, the scale and the escalation of attacks by well-armed Fulani upon the predominantly Christian communities does have an ideological basis and that that must be acknowledged? 
And will Her Majesty's Government make representations to the Government of Nigeria to ensure that it will be safe for the huge numbers of people who have been displaced by the Fulani attacks to be returned to their own homes? Uh, can I say to the noble lady that there is no denying that the violence described, and I am aware of her report from her charity, which I have looked at, and it is deeply disturbing in content. The violence described is gruesome, it is chilling, it is repugnant, and it is, is horrific. There is no denying that. But what I think we are all agreed upon is that we must address the basic causes of the violence, which seem to be uh, wider than simply a religious class. Religion is a factor, but attributing the violence to religious causes, I think, risks a dangerous oversimplification. I am aware that the noble baroness is a member of the um, FORB um, APPG, and that group is undertaking an inquiry uh, into the conflict in Nigeria and will produce a report. Uh, the government will uh, keenly await the outcome of that report. I think it will be a very important step forward in trying to understand what is happening. And just to reassure the noble lady, the United Kingdom government consistently uh, represents to the Nigerian government the need to address the causes of this completely unacceptable violence. Dr. Obayajeli Azukazili a former minister in Nigeria, now a presidential candidate, told me that a failure of the nation state in managing resources and institutional criminality was stoking tensions between the Fulani herders and local farmers. She is calling for a strong and competent military leadership to prevent non-state operations <laughs> taking place with impunity in Nigeria. It is the case, my lords, that over four years the UK has funded military training and capacity building in Nigeria from the Nigerian aid budget, in excess of some 300 million. Yet rape, kidnapping and murder rates continue to rise. Will the government therefore review measures to improve the effectiveness of peace and security national plans and measures to counter the threat of Boko Haram? As the noble lord will be aware, the UK government um, provides very significant support to try and address the challenge in Nigeria of Boko Haram, whose conduct is frankly vile and um, completely uh, unacceptable. Um, the UK government is also, as the Nobel Lord will be aware, making significant uh, contributions to assist humanitarian aid um, for Nigeria. My understanding is that last year we contributed 81.8 million, which uh, delivered food assistance to over 2.8 million, treatment for severe acute malnutrition to over 39,000 children, and access to clean water and sanitation to over 135,000 uh, people. But we are also working in an advisory capacity to the Nigerian Nigerian government emphasizing the need for respect for the rule of law and responsibility in the exercise of whatever the Nigerian uh, military um, is, is considering appropriate and effective in the areas of conflict. I agree with the noble lady. Thank you. My lords, this violence is clearly organized and systematic. Will Her Majesty's government ask the government of Nigeria to make available information regarding the sources and provision of sophisticated weaponry to the Fulani herders. Well, I thank the Right Reverend Prelate for that uh, question, which I think is pertinent. There, there is uh, an awareness, and indeed an apprehension, that much of the armory is illegal and circulating illegally, um, and that makes it very difficult to track and to understand where the armaments are being procured from. The UK government is aware of the situation, as is the Nigerian government, and I have noted the Right Reverend Prelate's observations, and I shall certainly make sure that that point is, um, is persecuted. My lord, my, lord, Prosecute. my lord, it is worth remembering that um, Nigeria is one of the biggest and most active members of the Commonwealth Network. Uh, will she reassure us that uh, Her Majesty's Government will use the good offices of the Commonwealth as far as they possibly can in addressing this horrific situation and seeking to improve, improve it? Yes, my noble friend is absolutely right. And um, the Commonwealth is, um, I think, an increasingly uh, important organisation in relation to issues like this. And he is correct that Nigeria is an important member of the Commonwealth. Um, it is also important, though, that um, other operators, and there are other operators, France and the US, the United Kingdom, do engage with the Nigerian government to do whatever we can 
to try and assist that government in addressing the clashes, because these clashes, as a noble lady Barnes Cox indicated in her initial question, are leading to scenes which are, frankly, um, hideous and um, absolutely repugnant. I completely agree with the noble lady, the minister, in terms of how complex uh, the causes of the conflict are. And certainly I support the government's response in terms of the stability and reconciliation programmes that they've been supporting. And of course it's 18 months ago that the most reverend primate uh, asked or uh, responded in an oral question similar to this one, uh, where he spoke of the need for community-based support, community organisation. Can the noble lady, the minister, tell us what we are continuing to do, particularly getting civil society involved and particularly uh, women's groups, because where women are involved, uh, we do see conflict diminishing. The no law makes a very important point, and uh, the UK government does endeavour to support situations where women have been uh, under threat. He will be aware of uh, action we took in respect of the uh, Dachshi girls, and we, we absolutely deplore the continued detention of um, Leah Sharibu. He'll also be aware of the action we took in relation to the Nigerian government in respect to the Chibok girls, and we um, absolutely appalled that, you know, of these Chibok girls, 113 apparently um, remain uh, in custody uh, by their captors, uh, Boko Haram. And we have introduced programmes to try and uh, assist with the situation. That means dealing with Boko Haram, where the Noble Lord will be aware a substantial package of intelligence, military and development support um, has been provided uh, by the United Kingdom government, but we also regularly raise the issue of abducted women and girls with the Nigerian government at the highest level. Beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, the government keeps all taxes under review, including the application of value-added tax. Any decision to amend the VAT regime with regard to physical and electronic publications must be carefully assessed against policy, economic and fiscal considerations before reaching any conclusions. I thank the noble, law, the noble minister for his predictable response, uh, but he will be aware that there are hundreds of thousands of blind and partially sighted people in this country who rely on audio books or digital books whose print size they can alter. Now that the EU has agreed that the anomaly whereby those uh, products are charged 20% VAT and the print books that the rest of us can rely upon are zero rated, now that that anomaly can be listed, lifted, it is clear that whether we remain in or leave the EU, the discrimination against the blind and partially sighted can be removed. Will he urge the, the uh, Chancellor to do so? Here, here. The Noble Lord makes a forceful case for equalising the VAT rate on e-publications and conventional publications. And he rightly says that on Tuesday the EU decided that countries now have the freedom to make that equalisation and so we could now move to a zero rate instead of a standard rate on e-publications. And Tuesday apparently was EVAT Freedom Day. <laughs> Can I say to the Noble Lord that the Professional Publishers Association are pursuing this with the Chancellor and the Treasury and on November 29th the Financial Secretary wrote back to the Professional Publishers Association saying, I quote, the industry's arguments and economic analysis are welcome to enable the government to determine the benefits and risks both for digital business and high street retailers associated with extending the zero rate of VAT to e-publications. And I note the forceful arguments made by the Noble Lord to support that case. Is it possible to follow the example of, German, of uh, Italy and France who have just removed their VAT uh, on the basis that it is a, a tax on learning and a tax on intellectual rights. Maybe this is the moment at which we could jump in there and show that whatever happens, we are not going to tax our children who uh, have to pay through the nose for their digital materials. The Noble Lord makes the same case as made by the Noble Lord, uh, Lord Foster of Bath. On Tuesday, 
all countries within the EU had the freedom to change the rate from 20%, the standard rate on e-publications, down to zero. Uh, we've only had that freedom for two days, so both the noble Lord Foster and the noble Lord are uh, very prompt in urging us to use this freedom. As I said, negotiations are now underway between the interested parties and the government to assess the case. And if the case is made, I'm sure the Chancellor will look at it very favourably. My Lords, perhaps I can help with my Lords. My Lords, perhaps I can help with a digital source of tax and welcome the proposal for a digital services tax, particularly given the demise of our high street. Um, could my noble friend ask the Chancellor either to accelerate that tax, because it's not due to come in until April 2020, uh, or put pressure on the established uh, tech giants to make substantial payments to the public purse until we have a proper tax, either at the UK, the EU, or indeed at international level? Well, the always welcome suggestions for raising money in tax rather than the representations which he normally gets, which is to spend more. It is indeed the case that at the moment we are planning to introduce the digital services tax in April 2020, and this is designed to bring, I think, 1.5 billion over the next four years, and it's targeted on the multinational companies operating in the digital sphere to make sure that they pay appropriate tax on the value they derive from UK business. It is seen to be an interim solution until we move to a global solution, and the UK is taking the lead in the OECD and G20 to secure that. But I certainly note my noble friend's suggestion that we should move it ahead uh, before 2020. And if we did that, there might be the resources to pay for the sum of money that we might lose from uh, zero rating e-publications. Uh, Lord, the <coughs> we expected a rather more positive response from the government. Our floor, uh, my party made clear two years ago that it was not prepared to see VAT in any shape or form increased on cultural goods. And we're in, it's very important that this is recognised as a very important dimension, particularly for the uh, specialist uh, uh, groups of people that have been referred to already. Could he move with some degree of urgency as far as the Chancellor is concerned? After all, uh, the uh, position is quite clear now in Europe, and it would look remiss if Britain stood out in this respect. I, I detect a certain degree of unanimity in the representations that have been made so far. And as I said, I have some sympathy with the argument that we should now equalise the tax on e-publications and conventional publications. We have only had that freedom for two days, so I hope the Noble Lord will understand that we haven't acted uh, so far. However, meetings are underway with interested parties to develop the case, and as I said earlier, if the Chancellor is convinced that a substantial case has been made, I'm sure he will respond favourably. Search from the uh, National Literacy Trust shows that one in eight children from disadvantaged backgrounds say that they don't have a book of their own at home. That's, now, has the government, in anticipation of, of, of this uh, potential, done any assessment on what zero rated that would have that, uh, as a way to tackle reading inequalities? Does it plan any such assessment? Because so many of these children do actually have access to a smartphone or a tablet. Mm. Again, the noble lady makes the case for uh, equalising. Uh, so far as literacy is concerned, this country has quite a good record if you look at the national, international literacy uh, standards. Uh, E-publications that are got from schools can at the moment get the VAT back through the local authorities. But again, the noble lady adds uh, reinforcements to the case that's already been made for using the freedom that we now have to equalise the rates. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name in the order paper and remind the House of my interests with the British Lecture Association. <clears throat> my Lords, we are working to improve quality and services for children with special <coughs> educational needs and disabilities. We are listening to parents. We have introduced new SEND inspections. We are investing to embed SEND in school improvement. We have commissioned an external review of exclusions. High needs funding has risen by a billion pounds since 2013. But we recognise the pressures on budgets and are monitoring the impact of the national funding formula on local authorities. Thanking the Minister for that reply, would he not agree, uh, agree with me that when the biggest group who are in this category, 
those who have not received a plan. And the uh, Ofsted says they struggle to receive the appropriate help. There is something fundamentally wrong. And would it also agree that in the page next to it, in the report, we have something saying that when you have a special school with structured lessons, you get good results? Is this not an example of how we should invest more in support within the mainstream classroom? Yeah, yeah. My Lords, we have done an enormous amount for this category of vulnerable children over the last few years. And one of the most important introductions were the education and health care plans, also supported by inspections of local authorities by Ofsted and by the Care Quality Commission. We're now getting increasing visibility of where good service provision is occurring and where it is not occurring, and we will continue to pursue that. What? <laughs> what? Could I support the thrust of this question and ask the Noble Lord, the Minister, whether the Department could be proactive in two ways. Firstly, on the back of the local government settlement and the Chancellor's budget at the end of October in, re in relation to the additional money for children's <coughs> services. And secondly, in terms of trying to get the education and health services to join up so that particularly young people transcend transcending from school to college and from college into adult life are able to access the funds they need and parents aren't put through the nightmare, which many of them are, in battling day in, day out to get their rights. My Lords, I think there are two questions there. If I just address the, the, the post-19 phase for children who are young people migrating from education into the world of work. We are now providing, providing supported internships and the, there were 1,200 of those in January of last year, which in itself was a 700 increase on the year before. We have legislated to promote the joint commissioning of service. The service. This means that children's services funding, funded primarily by education should be able to work effectively with adult services to support young people as they transition. In terms of the funding overall, we, have, we are very conscious of the high needs pressures. Uh, we have made an available £130 million of high needs funding available in 2017-18, and the high needs block rises by £142 million next year. Can be done, what can be done to uh, reduce the cost of uh, going to appeals tribunals, which deter many parents from asserting their rights in, face, in the face of obstruction from local authorities. Uh, and what can be done to stop local authorities uh, telling uh, parents, uh, quite wrongly as some do, that a, a local independent school cannot be named in an education, health and care plan? My Lords, this is a new, so a new provision. We have radically changed the way that, the, that uh, support is provided for vulnerable children. And whilst no one is happy to see money wasted in expensive tribunal proceedings, the percentage of tribunal cases is actually relatively consistent to the increasing number of education and health care plans who are awarded. So we will obviously challenge local authorities where too many tribunal cases are occurring, but they are still learning about this. The government is making, but is the Minister concerned at the rising numbers of children with SEND being excluded from school? Does he uh, recognise that high quality early years education can moderate behaviours which will then be improved in primary and secondary school? So is he concerned that families who are getting benefit from the government to uh, access high quality childcare for their SEND child say they need more money to be able to do so, despite the welcome investment the government has made? pushing it towards £300. Will you look at the funding uh, for childcare access for families with children with SEND, please? My Lords, we have certainly kept this under continual review. I mentioned some sums of money a moment ago, and as I have said earlier, the amount of overall funding into the high needs block has increased by a billion pounds in the last five years. But we also do accept that early interventions can have a very advantageous impact on young people with disabilities. And we are, through, for example, through having a clear focus on literacy, this is helping children with dyslexia, and we are also improving the initial teacher training and continuing professional development to raise the awareness. Order. Could the Noble Lord say, I think it's our turn. 
Could the noble lord the minister say how the government intends to address the training needs of staff in education and the capacity for improvement as identified in the report, given that over half of teachers say they have no, received no training on dyslexia? My Lords, we are introducing the, into the initial teacher training mo modules more training on, on, er, on these SEND issues. We mentioned in, in the case of, for example, mental health generally, we are including it as a voluntary uh, rollout from September of next year and it becomes compulsory in the following year. We have provided funding to the British Dyslexia Association to deliver training to teachers to support early identification of learning difficulties. Lords, the noble uh, Earl, in his question a moment ago, referred to the fact that there, a very high proportion of people, of young children with special educational needs, are excluded from school. More than a quarter of those with SEN designation were excluded last year, and it is five times the rate of permanent exclusion. Could the noble Lord, the Minister, tell us why this is, and whether the government is happy with that situation, or are they content? to allow schools to get rid of those pupils whom they find slightly inconvenient so as to improve their overall results. Mm. My Lords, I can categorically assert we are not happy with that, which is one of the reasons we have commissioned the report by Edward Timpson to look at the whole issue of exclusion. The Noble Lord is quite correct that the percentage of vulnerable children being excluded is too high. It is worth just saying that a school will not get a good or better rating from Ofsted unless they can absolutely justify any levels of exclusion beyond what might be the norm. We are also dealing with this by increasing the level of provision for special education and AP schooling. We have, we have already produced, we have already opened a number of free schools, 34 special free schools and a further 55 are due to be opened to help, to help this vulnerable group.